So welcome to this edition of On The Pulse, in which CMS experts provide updates on the key developments bringing innovation and disruption to the life sciences and healthcare sector. I'm your host, Nick Beckett, and today we're immersing ourselves in the enticing world of advertising. I'm delighted to be joined by three of the CMS life sciences specialists who regularly advise clients in this area. We've got Dora Pratrani from Hungary, Jens Wagner from Germany, and Gabriela Staba from Austria. So welcome to all of you. So advertising of medicines and medical devices is really a very complicated, uh, very detailed, uh, you know, and, and, and very different in different jurisdictions um, and constantly changing. So I think it's one of those areas that really is a challenge for clients to, uh, to keep on top of and to keep abreast of national developments as well. I think uh, helpfully uh, CMS has put together a handy guide on advertising of medicines and medical devices across 27 jurisdictions. So I think that's a useful uh, platform and a useful resource. And I think there are obviously some general uh, rules that will typically apply in most jurisdictions that, you know, there will be different rules probably for medicines and for medical devices, that typically prescription only uh, uh, pharmaceutical products may not be advertised to, to the public and that any claims that are made in respect of um, uh, health uh, claims, they, they need to be substantiated, to be true, to be not misleading. You can't have advertisements of, typically of unauthorized products and usually no off-label use claims to be made either. So I think you can see some areas where there are the similarities, but there's obviously a lot of um, differences in many uh, jurisdictions. And I thought maybe, Dora, we'd start with you uh, from the Hungarian perspective. Maybe tell us a little bit about some of the, the quirky features there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, you would expect that um, Hungary being part of the EU has harmonized uh, advertising laws um, as all other regulations. And actually, it is true. So advertising, especially advertising related consumer protection laws, are absolutely harmonized with the EU, uh, with the EU directives. Uh, therefore, the basis of the regulation is generally speaking the same. However, uh, despite the harmonization on EU level, there are certain categories uh, where you see differences. And Hungary actually created a unique product category to make it even more fun. And that is the category of medical aids. Uh, this category incorporates certain medical devices that are made available to patients for personal use, as well as certain other technical devices for nursing and caring purposes. Uh, I would say that one of the most typical examples is contact lenses, for example. Uh, the reason why medical aids are considered special in terms of advertising is that the applicable legal regulation for lay as well as professional advertising is as strict as the regime applicable to medicine advertising. According to such regulation, for example, the ads addressing professionals can only be delivered or communicated to healthcare professionals by the company's registered sales representatives. In our experience, this categorization is often a surprise for the multinational companies. I will note also a second difference, um, and that is how strict a law enforcement is. And I know that many countries say that our laws are the strictest. I would draw the attention of the fact that sometimes we experience that law enforcement by the Hungarian authorities is um, uh, has a tendency to develop a stricter standpoint than the authorities, for example, in other uh, CE regional countries. Uh, the reason for this firm approach derives from the fact that the Hungarian authorities in the past revealed serious misconduct, therefore became more responsive by launching vast amount of investigations for medicine adver advertisements and became more demanding by requesting detailed and even uh, more so scientifically grounded and objective substantiation of the advertised claims. Given this, a certain adver advertisement acceptable, for example, in the US or Poland, might actually be infringing in Hungary. And and Gabriella, I mean, in, in Austria, how do how do global companies deal with sort of the fragmentation of, of regulation there? In Austria, uh, we also have a lot of provisions that simply do not exist on the European level. For example, there uh, is a very specific thing in Austria. So you are allowed to advertise medicines without the marketing authorizations to doctors at international scientific events if they are predominantly attended by participants from abroad. On the other hand, it is prohibited to offer rebates in kind for products that are listed in the Austrian reimbursement code. 
So these are just two examples that highlight that it is really important to know about the applicable local law. On the other hand, there are certain common elements that will be required in all EU member states. So, for example, misleading statements, statements that are not supported by scientific evidence, or layman advertising without a risk warning will likely not be permitted anywhere within the EU. So, we have found that it can be an efficient approach to do an in-depth review of the advertising campaign in one country, and then make the necessary adaptations, and then afterwards uh, subject it to local review in the other countries where it's supposed to run. So, I mean, I think from what you're both saying, you know, there's many there's many areas of difference, um, but I guess one one area of similarity probably across the board is is the ba the need to have a basis for any health uh, and treatment claims that are made the fact that they need to be substantiated. And I guess the question that I've got is, how does one assess what level of scientific evidence uh, one needs in order to find uh, an acceptable uh, claim has been made? So maybe Jens, would you comment on that? Yes, of course. Uh, I think German courts are very strict in this regard, regarding uh, what is uh, considered as sufficient scientific evidence so uh, in order to not be misleading, you need a certain scientific published evidence. And uh, the German courts uh, generally apply uh, the rule that you need uh, a clinical study confirming to the so-called gold standard, a prospective randomized controlled clinical trial with a control group typically, and a sufficient statistical analysis, which is then published in a peer-reviewed journal so that you have a certain set of scientific dis discussion based on that. So I think that's uh, the main rule. Maybe we can uh, discuss later about certain exceptions. Um, with regard to comparative advertisements, um, the German courts require head-to-head -head studies, so no indirect comparisons are in general possible. Um, that's, I think, the, the main basis for the German legislation and the uh, court uh, practice. And, and for Austria, Gabi, is, is it some, something similar? It is very similar in Austria. We have noticed uh, that sometimes it can be difficult to establish that the data was published. This uh, can, for example, happen when the study has been completed, but the scientific publication that contains the study data is still under review. And as we all know, that can take forever and there's not always time to wait. So the question that arises then is whether you can rely on the data before the study is published in a scientific journal. For example, we have had a case where the data so far had only been disclosed in the poster and that poster was shown at the scientific conference and we had a discussion in court whether this constituted a publication or not. Unfortunately, we were able uh, to convince the court that the client can rely on the data in the poster because the poster was subject to peer review and it was accessible to the target audience at the conference and also via the conference website. So d does that mean then that um, there are some jurisdictions where it's, it's forbidden to use a clinical study if it doesn't? if the promotional statements don't reach those levels and uh, doesn't meet those criteria? Yeah, Nick, I think that's a very good question. And um, uh, I think you can't really apply this as a general rule. Of course, uh, the courts would like to have the gold standard, but there is no general prohibition that as such or per se, uh, a study which does not meet the gold standard criteria cannot be used at all. So um, that's, I think, partly good news also for for, for certain clinical trials, because um, many clinical trials have certain limitations. So um, it's more a question about um, correct um, advertising in this regard. It's also important for, for example, uh, often disease advertising, where you have small sample sizes, small number of patients. So there are, uh, based on that uh, basis, uh, certain limitations. So um, the, the advertising to the healthcare professional has to um, inform the uh, healthcare professional correctly about the limitations. 
It is the same for Austria. It is also not forbidden to use study data that does not meet the gold standards, but it does pose certain risks. So it is important to disclose any limitations of the study. And also it can be uh, problematic if you do cherry picking of the study data. Uh, for example, if an advertising claim is based on favorable study data that is unrelated to the primary endpoint of the study, then it's usually necessary to mention what the primary endpoint of the study was and what results with, the res with respect to the primary endpoint were reached. So, I mean, in terms of the limitations, how, how do you communicate those practically in, in the advertisement then, Jens? Yeah, that's, I think that's really uh, where uh, we, we handle a lot of cases. So typically, I, I would say we, we handle uh, maybe uh, 100 cases per year uh, litigation-wise here in, in, in our team in Germany. And uh, maybe the majority is about the correct uh, use of the limitations and the correct uh, uh, information to the healthcare professional uh, about the limitations of the study. So um, what you should take into account is to use uh, footnotes, maybe certain explanations, um, maybe even uh, discuss uh, if the claim as such may, may be a little bit more cautious, like suggest they may have an effect in this regard or a certain study showed certain results. But of course, maybe we need further studies. So I think that's um, you have to be a little bit cautious in this regard. And uh, in our experience, uh, maybe the majority of the litigation in Germany is about the correct uh, information about the limitations. And there is a German, maybe German peculiarity, uh, uh, which is about eye-catching advertising. If the wrong impression is created by the eye-catching advertising line, then you can't correct it just by a footnote. You have to correct it in the eye-catching itself. So that makes it not so easy to um, to to place the limitations of the study in the in the advertising correctly. I agree with Jens that a lot of the advice that we provide and also litigation that we handle deals with how to communicate the limitations of the study. Ultimately, the courts will look at the overall impression of the ad in its entirety and then decide if it's misleading or not. And because of that, the answer varies from case to case. So in some cases, it will be necessary to phrase the claim in a way that reflects the limitations of the study. In other cases, an explanatory statement or footnote will be sufficient. And in some cases, you'll have to do both limit the claim and then further explain it in a footnote. So there are, you know, there are countless different types of advertising and lots of different media that advertisements will appear in. They'll be in, in journals, healthcare and professional journals and magazines, and, you know, posters, television, radio. But I think one sort of high, uh, you know, highly prevalent area uh, of advertisement would be social media. So in, in a sort of online context, uh, are the rules different? How does it work uh, for in Austria, for example, Gabby? We have noticed that many of these new forms of online and social media marketing operate in the gray area or even use illegal practices. For example, in Austria, complaints about an advertising agency became public that offered services which it called online reputation management. So what it did was it created fake profiles in online forums and posted fake questions and answers relating to pharmaceutical products. And this would cause these products to appear more frequently and more prominent in Google searches. Clearly, uh, such practices are very problematic on many different levels. But I only want to focus on the advertising rules for pharmaceuticals here. So any posts about products that are paid for uh, clearly constitute advertising and must be labeled as such. In addition, the strict rules regarding layman advertising must be observed. Since the posts in online forums or on social media are usually available to the general public. This means that posts in relation to prescription products or references to recommendations from doctors or scientists are not allowed. In addition, the post must uh, contain a notice informing the reader that the drug may have side effects and that he or she may have to consult a pharmacist or doctor. 
Needless to say that in many cases, posts in online forums and social media do not observe these requirements and boundaries. In fact, they would require the same kind of review that you would devote to advertising via regular channels, since the same rules apply. But this is not very practical since social media advertising happens much faster and does not allow for prior legal review. Legal review only happens after the fact in case of a complaint. So what can you do to mitigate the risks associated with such advertising? So we have found that it may help to have social media advertising guidelines in place because these guidelines uh, provide guidance to your employees and also you can use them and show them uh, to the court or to authorities in case there is a complaint and demonstrate that you have uh, taken appropriate internal measures. So I think in, in addition to sort of online and um, social media advertisements, sometimes there are promotional activities that are almost sort of disguised advertisements and, and uh, promotions that may be you know, considered perhaps to be advertisements. Jens, have you got you know, experience in that area? Yeah, it's um, there are of course other promotional activities which are um, sometimes uh, connected with the um, provision of certain benefits or services, additional services. So what we um, what we see uh, are, for example, uh, benefits granted with respect to um, providing products free of charge for testing purposes. Um, particular with respect to rebates um, uh, systems, I think also uh, in this regard, uh, particular attention should be paid to promotion activities. What uh, what is a topic or has been a topic in the last uh, let's say years, but still ongoing discussion is about additional services provided, like patient support programs, for example. Uh, which of, on the one hand, of course, are in the interest uh, also of the patients, the healthcare professionals and the pharmaceutical uh, uh, manufacturers for safety reasons. But on the other hand, of course, maybe there is uh, the line is crossed and then it's, it's, uh, it's a benefit which is then granted and uh, which would be considered in uh, uh, prohibited uh, promotion activities under German law. Uh, what we also have seen here in, is uh, that under German law, um, the provision of products free of charge, as I've mentioned, is uh, prohibited. There are certain exceptions. And uh, in connection with the COVID-19 uh, crisis, um, the question has arisen whether it's possible to provide um, personal protective, protective equipment or uh, COVID-19 uh, treatment medicines free of charge uh, to certain organizations. And uh, in this regard, um, the legal analysis is really relevant before such activities are conducted, because it's not only a promotional issue, an advertising issue, uh, but also uh, anti-bribery uh, compliance uh, issue, which needs to be reviewed from a criminal law perspective. I think, Jens, you mentioned, you mentioned COVID, and obviously we're living through turbulent times and, and lots of changes in the marketplace, lots of new regulation, but also I think a number of new companies, you know, who have not historically been in the life sciences and healthcare space getting into it, seeing car manufacturers, you know, making ventilators and textile manufacturers making uh, surgical masks, et cetera. So I just wonder how in that context, how are those those sort of new entrants coping with the the regulation on advertising and, and how are the authorities dealing with it? Are they taking a more lenient approach? Are they taking a more um, you know, cautious approach? Uh, Dora, how about you address that one? Yeah, indeed, uh, quite a few uh, companies have decided to manufacture products that previously were not part of their product portfolio uh, since the crisis uh, has started. Uh, for example, in Hungary and also in Poland, the lubricant divisions of uh, their of uh, the biggest oil and gas companies have decided to produce hand sanitizers. And since the production of these products is subject to very similar strict requirements, the company could quite easily solve the switch of the production from lubricants to hand sanitizers if you only look at the production lines. Um, but you also needed very cooperative authorities to quickly uh, be able to, uh, to put uh, these new products on the market. And in both uh, cases, the authorities absolutely welcomed the initiative and demonstrated 100% cooperation during the implementation. 
What we also see is uh, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, increased activity uh, on behalf of the authorities, um, uh, especially to protect consumers uh, in uh, these especially vulnerable times. So what we have seen that, for example, the Hungarian Competition Authority seems quite active in respect of healthcare advertising recently. In March, they have uh, they have launched like three different campaigns. First, uh, uh, whether uh, products are unduly attributed certain medical properties. Second, uh, the authority carried out a sweeping investigation among web shops offering protection masks and products advertised as having antivirus effects. Uh, and uh, also in mid-April, uh, a similar procedure with respect to the sale of hand sanitizers on a TV program. We are very curious how um, these procedures will actually pan out, uh, but uh, this is a trend that we saw quite an early reaction from authorities across the region. And Gabby, for you know, how's the situation in Austria, especially when you know products are being given out free of charge, really just to try and show some support to the to the public who are struggling? What's the situation there? Well, it uh, really depends if it's a donation to a hospital or an individual doctor. For hospitals, it's relatively easy. In Austria, donations of medicines and medical devices to hospitals are allowed if they serve the purpose to support the healthcare system. And um, this is clearly the case for face masks, protective equipment, for disinfectants or medicines to treat COVID-19. It is, of course, important that the free supplies not made conditional on any further paid purchases of the company's products and that the company uh, keeps detailed records of such donations and that there is a contract in place with the hospital. In addition, it may be necessary to disclose such donations on the company's website under the applicable transparency rules. Completely different story are donations to individual doctors. These are generally prohibited and may in certain cases even lead to criminal sanctions. And there are no specific exceptions uh, available uh, with relation to COVID-19. However, there's a general exception that applies to inexpensive gifts that are relevant for the practice of medicine. And based on that exception, I think it would be acceptable to provide protective equipment such as face masks or disinfectants to doctor for doctors for free provided, of course, that they are for the doctor's own use when treating patients. Um, with respect to items of higher value, it's a little bit more difficult, but I think they are, uh, may be able to argue that they are given to the doctor for him to be able to continue treating patients in a COVID-19 environment rather than for promotional purposes. And in this case, they would be acceptable. Uh, but uh, you have to be very careful here. Such determinations must be made on a case-by-case -case basis and require a careful assessment of the situation and purpose of the donation. And uh, clearly, if a company decides to do it, uh, the company is operating in the gray zone because, unfortunately, there's no guidance available on this from the healthcare authorities. So there's a lot of there's a lot of risk out there. There's a lot. Uh, for companies to sort of navigate through in, in, in order to avoid being non-compliant. Um, but I wonder what, you know, what what's the greater risk? Is it the risk of investigations by the authorities? Or is it maybe uh, the risk rather from competitors making complaints and filing claims against them? Gabby, any, any sense on that? There's a clear answer for Austria. It is uh, competitors or consumer protection organizations filing claims. Especially the big pharma companies observe the advertising activities of their competitors very closely and do not hesitate to bring claims for violation of advertising rules. So the most common route in Austria would be to file a request for a preliminary injunction. It takes some time, usually one to two months, until a decision is uh, rendered in such proceedings. But nevertheless, it's a real threat because once the injunction has been granted, the advertising has to stop immediately. Otherwise, the competitor can enforce the injunction and coercive penalties will be imposed. And the Austrian enforcement system is very effective and penalties increase quickly in case of repeat violations. So companies usually comply with injunctions 
which means they have to stop their advertising campaign and remove the infringing ads from all media. There's also an alternative available in Austria, which is the FAMIC complaints procedure. FAMIC is an industry organization that includes most Austrian pharma companies. And the procedure, if a complaint is successful, results in an order to cease and desist. Um, and may also lead to the imposition of significant pen penalties in case there is a serious or a repeat violation. And uh, it has advantages compared to court proceedings. Uh, the obvious one is that it causes less cost for companies. And this is also the reason why it's uh, sometimes used uh, by companies in Austria, although it's clearly less common than court proceedings. And uh, there's also the possibility of enforcement activities of regulatory authorities, but those are rare in Austria, although in theory significant fines of up to 25,000 euros or 50,000 euros in case of repeat violations are possible. Dora, I mean, how, how's this area of risk assessed in, in Hungary? Uh, we see less uh, cases for internet injunctions. Uh, so we usually call our clients' attention to what I would call the big three, the so-called PRA factors of risk and the exposures, uh, where F stands for fine, R, reputational loss, and A is for actions of competitors. Uh, when you talk about fines, uh, Gabriele, you mentioned 25 to 50,000 euros significant fines. Actually, we have seen already cases uh, where the um, uh, where uh, fines were uh, approximately 300,000 euros because these are uh, calculated on the basis of advertising costs, and these costs can be quite high. The, the fines are also increasing. But what we also would like to call the attention to is um, that actually uh, we expect that these uh, fines will significantly increase in the future because the trend is quite threatening. If you look at the latest practice of the Competition of, uh, Authority of Hungary, they have uh, issued the consumer protection fines in the range of 3 million and then 7 million uh, in the last months. So both were tech-related cases, but uh, both uh, were what uh, the authorities called global advertising, global campaigns, and purely due to the Hungarian impacts, uh, these uh, very significant fines were imposed. Secondly, the reputational uh, losses can be also quite harsh uh, and uh, can actually affect uh, also the future businesses. Uh, the Hungarian media is directly served by the authorities as they usually inform them uh, on their recent press releases and decisions. Given that these pieces of news have significant public interest, uh, the media prefers to publish and promote the articles on misconduct in the healthcare sector, assuring to, that the news reach actually the, page, the patients. And thirdly, uh, very similarly the, to what you said, Gabriela, about uh, industry uh, association forums, we see that actually actions of competitors can be uh, either by turning to uh, industry association forums or uh, launching anonymous complaints uh, towards uh, authorities, consumer protection authorities. Both can be uh, very harmful uh, for the companies. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to what uh, Gabi already said for Austria, because in, in Germany, for example, the vast majority of uh, our experience, and I think the court uh, statistics would be that maybe more than 90% of all litigation in the advertising sector are preliminary injunction proceedings. And in this regard, uh, the deadlines are extremely short. So you have to react very quickly. It typically starts with a warning letter, which you have to answer within a few days. And then um, the competitor will go to the court, ask for a preliminary injunction. And then uh, you, uh, as a defendant, has the possibility, the option to file what we call a protective writ. And also this protective writ, you have to prepare within, let's say, two or three days, otherwise it's too late. So our advice in particular, with, if you would like to launch a new product uh, in Germany, you have to prepare yourself and have everything uh, on the shelf and available to provide these response and also the protective writ. I think that's extremely important because if you start then and collect all the information, maybe on an international level, it's too late and it's extremely difficult 
to really collect everything and draft something uh, within a few days. So a real, a real need for speed then. Yeah. So uh, I think I think there's plenty then for clients to be uh, to be mindful of to uh, keep track of, and obviously, what is a, a very fast changing environment. Um, I mean, just looking to the future, I guess we can probably expect then more investigations. Um, from what Dora's saying, I think probably higher fines as well, perhaps more litigation um, involving you know actions, activity, fines, um, uh, proceedings between competitors. And presumably in the area of medical devices, the, uh, the the awaited medical device regulation, although, you know, delayed until next May, I mean, that's going to have an impact as well with, you know, what will probably be the first um, harmonized advertising rules on medical devices, at least to, you know, to some extent. So I think quite a lot, a lot to come as well. So um, I think we're we're pretty much out of time now. So, so thank you to Jens, to Dora, to Gabriella for your insights. Thank you all to everyone for joining us on this edition of On The Pulse. We hope you found our discussions to be thought provoking and insightful. If you'd like to discuss any of the topics covered, please do get in touch. To find out more about On The Pulse and the CMS Global Life Sciences and Healthcare Group, visit cms.law. Audio versions of On The Pulse are available through your usual podcast store.